The clock is ticking on Capitol Hill. Lawmakers coming up against a Friday deadline to strike a deal on spending or partially shut down the government. And casting a shadow over it all, the question of funding for President Trump's border wall. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. There you are. And welcome to America's News Headquarters. I'm Arthel Neville. Hey, nice to see you. Hello, <laughs> nice to good see morning, you, Arthel. Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Sean. President Trump, as you know, has threatened to shut down the government if the lawmakers do not allocate $5 billion for his wall. Well, Democratic leaders Nancy Pelosi and Senator Chuck Schumer say, well, that's not happening. Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan, who's a member of the House Appropriations Committee, weighed in just moments ago in an exclusive interview on Sunday Morning Futures. It's a sign of the dysfunction in Washington. We've got to figure out how to come together here around, um, around some basic budgets. I mean, we believe in border security. I believe in, in border security. We have technologies today that are far surpass uh, a wall. I mean, this is not the 15th century. Molly Hennenberg has the very latest from a Washington newsroom on all this. So, Molly, it sounds like the Democrats are really digging in and saying that they will not allocate $5 billion for the wall, though they have proposed $1.3 billion for border security. Hi, Eric. Certainly the position of the top Democrat in the Senate, New York Senator Chuck Schumer, who said this morning that President Trump doesn't have the votes in Congress to get more money and that the president and Republicans should get on board with two other options proposed by Democrats, such as con a continuing resolution or CR to fund the government for now and maybe take up the wall again in 2019. Those two options are the kinds of things that Republicans have supported in the past. And when you talk to them privately, even publicly, a lot of them have said a CR is much preferable to a shutdown. They just have to have the guts to tell President Trump he's off on the deep end here. And all he's all right. going to get with his temper tantrum is a shutdown. He will not get a wall. President Trump told Senator Schumer and Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi that he wants about $4 billion more than they want to provide for the border wall and border enhancements. The president says he would be, quote, proud to shut down the government for border security. Eric? And Molly, what are Republicans uh, saying about the president's threat? Well, the wall is something the president campaigned on, and he wants that wall. Some of his GOP colleagues in Congress are hoping for more of a compromise. There's absolutely no excuse to shut down government on this issue or any other issue. I have suggested that we revisit a compromise proposal that we brought forth earlier this year. I helped craft it. It was offered by Senators King and Rounds, and it provided $2.5 billion this year and over the next 10 years uh, to fully fund the border security initiative. One of the president's top advisors says this goes beyond a wall, that it's a matter of national security. This is a president who knows that we as a nation have been spending billions of dollars over decades helping other nations protect their own sovereign borders. It's high time we do it here. The top Senate Republican Mitch McConnell says, quote, magic things happen at Christmas. And he says he'd like to see a smooth ending to this budget battle. Eric? All right, let's see if Santa has a big bag of $5 billion <laughs> and it coming down the chimney. We'll see. All, All right, right, thanks, Molly. Arthel? All right, Eric, for more on this, let's bring in Francesca Chambers. She's the White House correspondent for the Daily Mail. Always nice to see you, Francesca. Nice to see you. And, Arthel, I have to, I have to tell you right away, uh, I don't think that the president's getting a big bag of $5 billion from Congress for this border wall this Christmas. Okay, having said that, then, is the partial <laughs> shutdown imminent? Or if it's not, Francesca, what will ward it off? Well, the White House is now shopping a potential short-term continuing resolution, which would push off this debate until early next year. The only problem with that is, is the president, he currently has leverage because Republicans control the House of Representatives. In early next year, Democrats will take control of the House of Representatives. And that is why some conservatives in Congress, including the House Freedom Caucus, have said now is the time. If the president is going to force the issue through a shutdown, down, he'd have to do it by this Friday, December 21st. Mm -hmm. and, and meanwhile, you've got the budget director, who is now the White House chief of staff, supposedly acting, but probably will be. Uh, will the Mick Mulvaney promotion make a difference? 
He is currently acting, and he still remains the head of the budget office, but his deputy will be doing the day-to-day -day activities the White House has said. But that being said, if there was a shutdown, he would be the one who would technically have to oversee that. So this complicates the matter, because he's just now learning the responsibilities of being chief of staff. John Kelly is still there, but he's leaving at the end of this year. So to put Mick Mulvane in a position where he'd have to oversee a shutdown, either at the end of this year or at the beginning of next year, while he's learning the ropes of being White House chief of staff, again, really complicates the issue and might also suggest that the White House and President Trump are now really rethinking the idea of a government shutdown. Interesting, interesting. I mean, look, of course, first and foremost, this the concern should be for the people, you know, Americans. That said, talk to me again about which party stands to get stung by a partial government shutdown. Which party? Well, the president previously said that he think, thinks it would be a political winner for Republicans, but that was before we were talking about having a shutdown that would come just a few days before Christmas time. And a shutdown uh, would only affect 25 percent of the government, roughly, in this case. It's mm -hmm. not the same as in the past. Um, this was a, re a sliver of the government. Defense Department has already been funded. There are other places like DHS that have not been funded yet that it would affect. And among that, there are federal workers who would be furloughed load without any pay. Now, Congress often comes back and, right. and gives them that pay. However, at the time, it would essentially be an unpaid leave of absence. Then there are also federal workers who would be required to work without pay, and they would definitely be paid back after the fact. So it would put a lot of families in limbo over the holidays. Absolutely. Let, let's play some sound, uh, more sound from Senator Chuck Schumer, who was on Meet the Press this morning. President Trump should understand there are not the votes for the wall in the House or the Senate. He is not going to get the wall in any form. We Democrats, Leader Pelosi and I, offered the president uh, two options as to how to avoid the shutdown. And we should not let a temper tantrum, uh, threats, um, push us in the direction of doing something that everybody, even our Republican colleagues, know is wrong. Well, in that publicized meeting with the president and uh, soon to be possibly again Speaker Pelosi and uh, Senator Schumer, Schumer, the president said, "Look, you know what? I'll take the blame. He'd take the ma mantle if there if there is indeed a, a shutdown partially. You know, can the president afford to hang the gold Trump sign on a partial government shutdown? Well." He just had an election. There's not another election for two years, so it's not something that in the short term would necessarily have a huge political effect on the president. And his border wall, on the other hand, is something that he's been promising this entire time, a major campaign promise, one of his top campaign promises. Uh, and so it's clearly something that the president wants to see, to see completed, to see finished. But Chuck Schumer in that interview saying that he would give a little bit of wiggle room, it's not clear what exactly he'd be willing to give the president on this other than what he's already stated, which would either be the $1.6 billion that could be used for fencing and border security, but not a concrete wall, right. or to extend or essentially mirror the funding that's already there from this past fiscal year, and that's $1.3 billion, but again, fencing and not a concrete wall. So the president really does have to make a choice here about how he wants to proceed, because if he pushes it off again until Republicans uh, discuss this again at the end of next year, uh, Republicans again will not be in charge of the House. Right. He will have the Senate, but he won't have the House, and it'll be several more months before this conversation would restart. So the president has to make a choice soon and very soon. Absolutely. Um, so before I let you go, can you get Santa to bring me the bag of money, Francesca? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all hoping Santa is very generous this year. <laughs> Absolutely. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you. <laughs> well, president Trump and his lawyers are really firing back at Michael Cohen and Robert Mueller after the president's former so-called fixer was sentenced to prison this past week. Rudy Giuliani, the president's lawyer, slamming Cohen as he says a liar and says the president did not know about the payments that uh, were made to two women during the 2016 campaign. Ellison Barber is live at the White House with the very latest on these claims. Hi, Ellison. 
Hey, Eric, Michael Cohen says that nothing was done within the Trump organization without the knowledge of Donald Trump. He also says that President Trump, not only did he know about these payments, but Michael Cohen claims that the president directed him to make them and that he directed him to become involved in these matters. The president's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, he says that that is false, that the president has repeatedly said it is false. And either way, Giuliani argues it is not a crime to make that sort of payment. Here's Mr. Giuliani, followed by Michael Cohen's former lawyer, Lanny Davis. Paying uh, $230,000 to Stormy, whatever, and paying $150,000 to the other one is not a crime. The Edwards case determines that she was paid a million one to be a no-show in his campaign. As you know, Mayor, the Redwood case is actually quite different. The judge in that case said that if, if this judge. payment, the, George, the judge... It's not the judge. It's the FEC. The FEC ruled on the Edwards case before they prosecuted it. The FEC ruled it's no violation of the campaign finance law. Mr. Giuliani going on the air today ignoring the fact the FEC never ruled mm -hmm. that what John Edwards did was appropriate. That's a lie. There was never a ruling. And we'll see what the facts, which is something alien to Mr. Giuliani and Mr. Trump. Yeah. Let's see what the facts show. A few days ago, Mr. Cohen was sentenced to three years in prison. Around that time, President Trump tweeted, quote, I never directed Michael Cohen to break the law. He was a lawyer, and he is supposed to know the law. It's called advice of counsel, and a lawyer has great liability if a mistake is made. That is why they get paid. The president and his lawyers say Cohen is a rat, a liar, pathetic, and that he's simply doing all of this to try and embarrass the president. Michael Cohen says that, well, he admits that he has not always told the truth in the past, but he says in this particular instance, he is telling the truth, and he claims that the special counsel has plenty of information to support his version of events. Eric? All right, Allison, thanks so much. Well, Eric, a bombshell ruling by a federal judge after he decides that Obamacare is unconstitutional, with millions of Americans wondering what that means for their future health care. Lawmakers are speaking out as this issue is sure to be front and center in the new Congress. Plus, the U.S. giving countries in Africa a choice. Choose Washington or side with Beijing and Moscow. Should that be a tough decision? Retired General Jack Keane joins us next to let us know how the alliance would be beneficial to the U.S. Under our new Africa strategy, we will target U.S. funding toward key countries and particular strategic objectives. All U.S. aid on the continent will advance U.S. interest and help African nations move toward self-reliance. I'm Ken. Unfortunately, billions upon billions of U.S. taxpayer dollars have not achieved the desired effects. They have not stopped the scourge of terrorism, radicalism, and violence. They have not prevented other powers, such as China and Russia, from taking advantage of African states to increase their own power and influence. National Security Advisor John Bolton laying out the U.S. policy in Africa. Mr. Bolton unveiling the new approach in a speech urging leaders on the continent to ally or ally themselves with the United States because it's to their economic benefit. Now, Congressman from California, Devin Nunes, reacting earlier today in an exclusive interview on Sunday Morning Futures. The American people have been... Uh, have been having to listen to this Russia nonsense for so long, and it's not that Putin's not a bad guy, and in fact, we had been the ones that had warned about Putin's ever advancing um, uh, capabilities. But at the same time, we've totally ignored China. Retired four-star General Jack Keane joins us now. He is also a Fox News contributor. General Keane, good to see you. Good to see you, Arthur. Thank you. Let's start here. Who is poised to service Africa better? Is it the U.S. or is it the China-Russia combo? Well, frankly, we haven't had much of an African strategy for years, and, and that's what this administration, I think, has accurately done. You know, they, they really have, have set the strategic framework in, in, in exactly the right place because we're, we've returned to big power competition once again, and now it's with Russia and China. And what Russia and China, they've been very aggressive in Africa. China, very uh, economically speaking, they're economic predators there. And Russia, in terms of arms deals and supporting other militaries. And what they have created is dependency and domination. And here, here comes the United States. What we're trying to do is push these countries and move them towards self-reliance, 
independence and economic growth. Mm -hmm. And I think the strategy is, is absolutely the correct one. And it'll, it'll, it'll go a long way to countering the Chinese and Russian influence. Because I was reading in the Wall Street Journal that China is spending billions, as you just mentioned, billions of dollars to build railways, dams, oil refineries, and other major projects across Africa. At the same time, Russia has expanded its military cooperation on the continent. So, General Keene, what is the worldwide fallout if China and Russia become the geopolitical gurus to Africa? Well, we're countering uh, Russia and China and other places as well, and this is, this is certainly a place that needs stabilization. And I think the strategy that we've had in the past has been largely counterterrorism, and that certainly is appropriate and still there, and we'll, we'll continue that effort. But what the Chinese are up to uh, has really been quite significant. And when I say they're economic predators, what I mean by that is they go in there and they, they give out major loans so they can build dams, bridges, etc. And the countries have difficulty meeting the interest on those loans and they default on them. And then China takes over everything. And by the way, they only use China labor force. They don't permit the locals to be a part of this. So there's not a lot of economic gain in terms of employment for these countries. Mm -hmm. That strategy that China is using, I think it, over time, we're already starting to see some of it in, in Southeast Asia. It wears people a little thin yeah. because they're, they're economic predators and they're bullies in the execution of it. So then what is the advantage for the U.S. if Africa cozies up to the U.S.? And why does this matter? Well, first of all, we want those countries moving in the right direction in terms of their own ind independence and their own economic growth for the stability of the region. The natural resources in Africa are absolutely staggering. And, and, and certainly the United States has interest in that from an economic perspective. This strategy that we're, we're talking about is going to be largely economic. It, we already have a military presence there, and, and frankly, some of that's going to be reduced in the near term. This economic strategy, I think, has, has a chance for a, a huge payoff. It's, it's a long-term strategy. It's strategic and it's not tactical, and that's what I like about it. And the way you explain it to us, it seems to be beneficial to Africa, but will Africa, you know, a, a agree to it? Well, I think they'll be interested in what the United States is promoting. We're not seeking their dependency on us. We're not seeking influence and control and domination, which is what Russia and China are about. We're seeking their economic vibrancy, certainly, and that will have a payoff for us because our businesses will be investing there, and certainly they'll be reaping the benefits of that investment. But the biggest payoff will be the stability and security and prosperity of Africa itself, something that the United States has interest in as a global leader. And I think that what the Trump administration has done largely with their change of national security strategy is putting the United States once again on the world stage as a global leader, promoting stability and security and prosperity. And that's what this is really all about. And you think the African uh, leaders there in various nations will sort of put it in the past, President Trump's missteps, his um, derogatory marks that he made early in his administration, and, and move forward? Do you think that would be the case? I think the rhetoric sometimes that the president is accused of having, some of that's false, some but of I mean, it we is heard real. Him. He called them S-hole nations. He referred to but some I of it. Think, I think what these countries, I, I, I've been around the world uh, talking to leaders in, uh, since President Trump has been inaugurated, and what they, what they follow are U.S. policy, U.S. actions. They've learned just, I think, like a lot of Americans have learned, the president tweets a lot, and you listen to the rhetoric, you take it into account to be sure, but it's U.S. policy that is really impacting these countries, and that's what they're going to pay attention to. Okay, we will leave it there, General Jack Keane. Thank you very much. Good talking to you, Arthur. Likewise. Well, meanwhile, climate change was the focus of delegates from nearly 200 countries, and they agreed at a U.N. meeting in Poland on setting tougher targets to try and cut down on greenhouse gas emissions around the globe. You know, many environmentalists are expressing frustration that those rules do not go far enough to combat climate change as the Trump administration, joined by Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, pushed back on some of those demands. Jackie Heinrich is live in our New York City newsroom with more on what they agreed to. Hi, Jackie.
Hi, Eric. Global leaders decided on a set of rules to govern the 2015 Paris Climate Accord after two weeks of disagreements and also a stalemate Friday that forced the conference to go ahead of its scheduled end. 196 countries approved the new guidelines to measure and report greenhouse gases and reduce emissions, but the United States, the second highest in the world for emissions, said they didn't welcome the findings of a U.N. climate report, which says carbon pollution must be cut in half by 2030 to avoid disastrous climate change. President Trump vowed to bow out of the Paris Climate Accord, but the U.S. still had a presence at the conference because the United States can't officially withdraw until 2020. If I was in the Paris Accord, we would be paying trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars for nothing. And I wouldn't do that. I'm concerned that the United States will lose trillions and trillions if it doesn't take action. Um, that's true in terms of the impacts um, that we'll face. We've seen that with hurricanes. We've seen it with fires just in the last couple of months. Environmental activists in some countries, particularly vulnerable to global warming, threatened to block that resolution over concerns about carbon credits, which are awarded to countries for their efforts to reduce emissions. In the end, some key points of that agreement were put off to a later deadline after Brazil insisted on new language, which critics say may allow them to double count carbon credits because of their large rainforest cover. The conference also drew criticism that the agreement doesn't provide a sufficient response to the impacts of climate change, saying it failed to deliver a clear commitment to further reduce climate change by the deadline of 2030. Our negotiators have failed us for 24 years. And even more than that, our governments back home continue to fail on behalf of the good negotiators. So I don't put much stake into the COP negotiation process. The current set of guidelines would put the world on course for a more or less three degrees Celsius global warming cap by the end of the century. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change wanted a 1.5 degree cap. Eric. All right, Jackie, the challenge of our time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Arthel. Eric, a major ruling from deep in the heart of Texas putting the future of Obamacare in doubt how both parties are responding as questions loom about what it means for millions of Americans, plus the family of a seven-year-old girl who died in the custody of U.S. Border Patrol, now disputing the official account of what happened. The family of Jacqueline Kyle Makin is still coping with their profound loss. The death of a child is the most painful experience that a parent or family can endure. It's an awful, awful ruling. We're going to fight this tooth and nail. And the first thing we're going to do when we get back there uh, in the Senate is urge, put a vote on the floor, urging an intervention in the case. Democrats vowing to appeal a federal judge's ruling that the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, is unconstitutional. The decision doesn't immediately affect coverage for Americans. Meanwhile, President Trump reacting on Twitter, saying, quote, as I predicted all along, Obamacare has been struck down as an unconstitutional disaster. Now, Congress must pass a strong law that provides great health care and protects pre-existing conditions. Mitch and Nancy get it done. Garrett Tinney is live now from Washington with more. Garrett? Well, Arthel, the big question right now is what's next? This ruling does not immediately affect coverage because it will be appealed and it's expected to eventually reach the Supreme Court. If that happens, Democrats are predicting the high court will for a third time rule that Obamacare is constitutional. But Senator Chuck Schumer doesn't want to take any chances, as you heard there. He is urging Congress to get involved and stop this lawsuit from going any further. We first have to undo this awful decision because, look, we have a Republican president, we have a Republican Senate. They've spent a lot of time sabotaging health care. So that's the first job. But after that, Democrats, as we did in 2018 rather successfully, are going to make health care a major, probably the major issue in the upcoming campaigns. Most Republican lawmakers are hoping the Supreme Court will do what they have been trying to do for eight years now and finally end Obamacare. But on ABC's This Week, Senator Susan Collins of Maine said she believes the courts will ultimately overturn this latest ruling and leave Obamacare in place. The judge's ruling was far too sweeping. He could have taken a much more surgical approach and just struck down the individual mandate and kept the rest of the law intact. I believe that it will be overturned. 
Either way, though, health care continues to be a major issue across the country and one that Congress, particularly now a divided Congress, doesn't have any clear answers to, at least as of now. Arthel? Garrett Tinney, thank you. You got it. The death of a child is the most painful experience that a parent or family can endure. Jacqueline and her father came to the United States seeking something that thousands have been seeking for years, an escape from the dangerous situation in their home country. This was their right under U.S. and international law. Oh, that's the attorney for the father of the 17-year-old uh, Guatemalan girl who so tragically died in U.S. Border Patrol custody. Jacqueline Call McCann's family is also disputing the account from U.S. officials who said their daughter had not been given food or water for several days while crossing the border. Jacqueline and her father were among a large group of migrants arrested earlier this month near a remote border crossing in New Mexico. Jeff Paul is live in Los Angeles with more on these new developments in this tragic case. Hi, Jeff. Yeah, Eric, we're learning more today about that little girl who died, seven-year-old Jacqueline Call McKean. And for the first time, we're hearing from some of her family members back home in Guatemala. They say Jacqueline had just received her first pair of shoes from her father a few weeks ago for their journey. Jacqueline and her father, though, ended up traveling thousands of miles from their incredibly poor village to the U.S. border. But they were among a large group of migrants arrested at a remote border crossing near New Mexico. A few hours later, while on a bus headed to the nearest Border Patrol station, Jacqueline started vomiting and then stopped breathing. She then later died at a Texas hospital. My husband went away because of the poverty, the extreme poverty that we live in. Some people have asked us about her feelings about the trip. She left with joy because she wanted to arrive to the United States. Border Patrol says they did everything they could to save the girl, but they say she hadn't had food and water in days. They also say an initial screening showed no health issues and that Jacqueline's father signed a form stating she was okay. Jacqueline's father reportedly has no complaints about how Border Patrol agents treated him and his daughter, but lawyers for the family are still calling for a thorough and objective investigation. Senate Democrats echoing that call to action, sending a letter to the Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security. Eric. Just heartbreaking. Jeff, thanks. Martha. Take you to France now, <clears throat> excuse me, where we're following another big story. The Yellow Vest protesters dwindling in numbers this weekend, but thousands remain defiant, occupying major traffic circles around the country. Police officers have been mobilized to keep the crowds under control. Meanwhile, in Strasbourg, it's taking a pause to mourn the victims of the Christmas market attack. Senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott is live in Paris with the very latest. Greg. Hi, Arthel. Yeah, things are getting back to normal pretty much here in Paris and France, yet after another day of protests. Uh, this uh, happened as an anti-government protest, basically, by these Yellow Vest protesters, activists that we've been talking about. We were out on the street, along with a whole lot of police. There was tear gas, there was stun grenades, there was water cannons, and in fact, some scuffles, but much less violence than we saw last Saturday. Activists as you noted, are continuing where they started. They're staging sit-ins at traffic circles and along highways across the country. Remember, this started as a protest against high government gasoline tax aimed at combating global warming. French President Macron last week offered more tax cuts and some government handouts to the protesters. That might have kept Saturday's numbers down, but his numbers continue to go down. A new poll released today his approval rating is at 23 percent nationwide. Another reason, perhaps, uh, Arthel, that we saw less unrest on Saturday, national attention in the last couple of days focused on a terror in the eastern French city of Strasbourg. The deadly attack happened Tuesday night. The gunman was caught and killed Thursday night. Today, there was a memorial in the center of the city. The mayor of that city, Arthel, had some strong words to say at that memorial. I'm quoting him here. We will continue to defend our values against those who attack them. Pretty good words to remember. Back Absolutely. To you. 636 there in the evening in Paris. Greg Palcott, thank you very much. Eric? Release the FBI Jimmy Hoffa files. You know, that's our call to the government. The Bureau has them. The Hoffa family wants them. And the American people should finally see what the government knows. 
Coming up, our exclusive investigation of what happened to the iconic labor leader. Former Fox News producer Ed Barnes and I found blood evidence in a house where a confessed hitman says he shot Hoffa. Ed is here on what happened, where he says Hoffa's body went, and a new reason why he was murdered. Money, greed, and the mafia. Jimmy Hoffa, straight ahead. And now to our exclusive investigation of the most infamous disappearance of our time. What happened to Jimmy Hoffa? You know, that is explored in our Fox Nation special, Riddle, the search for James R. Hoffa. We are calling for the FBI files to be fully released finally to find out what investigators knew and when. You know, in 2004, we went to this house in Detroit after confessed mob hitman and Teamsters local president Frank Sheeran told me he shot Hoffa twice in the head in that house back in 1975. There's Fox News producer Ed Barnes and myself. We're taking up the tiles on the hardwood floor, looking for evidence of the murder, and take a look. We found it. A blood pattern on that floor that fits Sharon's story precisely. We found the largest amount of possible blood evidence in front of the closet door where Sharon says Hoffa's head at the floor. Seven drops trailing down the hallway where Sharon said two accomplices dragged Hoffa's lifeless body to the kitchen and out the back door to be cremated. I met Sharon as part of his proposed biography, which became the best-selling book, I Heard You Paint Houses, by his lawyer, Charlie Brandt. With us now, Ed Barnes, who took up that floor with me, dug in the basement, and has investigated Frank Sharon going back for decades. Ed, welcome. Great to see you, my friend. Good to be back. Should the FBI, should the government release all the files finally, unredacted, complete and open, so the public can see what happened? Yeah, there's a great deal of files, and, and there, there is no sort of one half a file that we have to know. There, there's in New Jersey, there's there's a whole like a rooms full. We saw the room full that the, the, the Detroit FBI had before they took it back. There's the, in New York as well. There's the and there's there's ancillary cases around that 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 if you put it all together, it finally give us. The, uh, the, the story of um, what, what, what's almost the end of the mafia, because what happens after Hoffa dies or disappears is a massive federal effort. That's, that was the, the thing that coalesced every, the, all the law enforcement agencies to, to, to say this is too far. You know, the, 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 the calculated killing of an American labor leader and major political figure and getting away with it. That's stunning. It, and that moved, that, moved, that, that moved the country. It really was, in a sense, an I iconic moment, uh, the, the, the decline of the labor union power, Absolutely. the industrial might of America in many ways mm -hmm. uh, in Detroit, although it's still a thriving community, right. uh, represented by that murder of Jimmy Hoffa. More than that, the, 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 I mean, the, the Central States Pension Fund at that point was the largest amount of money ever accumulated. So it was the hopes and futures of the, the retirement and, 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 and the, uh, the, the um, economic well-being of, of working class. When, 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 that, when Hoffa died, that went into the hands of the mob, and, uh, and a lot of it disappeared. Now, when we went into the house in Detroit, yeah. for example, we found that that blood evidence, the FBI did test 50 samples. Right. They came up with 28 samples were positive for blood. Two, uh, they got DNA from two samples. One was in, uh, incomplete. Another one matched an unknown male, so they did not match right. the blood of Jimmy Hoffa to what we found in the house. To you, does that disprove Frank Sheeran's story? No, I mean, the, the unlikely, the, it was unlikely you were going to get DNA match after that, that, that amount of time, too. And luminol does, does degrade some of the blood, um, so you can't... It, I, the, the point that's of using you, the luminol the, was basically saying, you know, there have been so many cases where the, where the FBI has gone out and tried to dig up a body of Hoffa and things like that. But this, this at least gave us the, the, the it, uh, circumstantial evidence. It's, yeah. it, it matched his story completely. We were probably going to get more than that. And, uh, and it, yeah, it convinced me and you and, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, that the story he was, that Sharon was telling at that point had, had a great deal of credibility. Luminol finds the evidence of blood, which, which we did find in the house. And we're calling in the FBI not just to release the files, but to retest the blood, the floorboards that we found. Now, in terms of a theory of why he was uh, murdered, for years it's always been, well, he wanted to regain the Teamsters presidency. Right, right. Frank Fritzsimmons uh, was in the presidency and had a good deal with the mafia yeah, and yeah. the mob. Right. But you have found... Who years ago? This is it. This is right. this news. Sorry to age you, but this is a forty-year-old, <laughs> forty years old, forty years ago. Ed wrote this exclusive for the Patterson Morning uh, newspaper, the Morning News. The doctor and the mob. What is this new theory that has nothing to do with him wanting to regain the Teamsters presidency, no, no. but it has to do with money? It absolutely does. Uh, uh, 
The one of the things you have to understand that, that, that for the for the mob, having a casino in Vegas was, 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 was recreate what they had in Havana, which was the golden age of the mob. And uh, and Tony Provenzano, and I think a good deal of the number of other, other organized crime figures in New York were going, why aren't we on the Vegas Strip? So Gabe Bergoglio's partner, right, buys. So I'll tell you how, uh, the reason this really works. Mm -hmm. The day ha the, the, when they were killing Hoffa, these Bergoglio's partner is actually buying the 9.3 acres next to the dunes on the strip in Vegas. Hoffa's gone, clear it up. And they were having murder, really hard problems in New York funding a casino. Central States Pension Fund could do that because it was, again, it was the largest single amassing of cash that the, the world had seen up until that time. So, yes. Bergoglio, we know he's there at the scene. Um, there's arguments whether he's killed the guy or Sharon did that it. it we talk that Sal Bergoglio, right. uh, known as Sally Bugs, and we have some video of Sal Bergoglio when he uh, testified, but there he is, uh, saying no comment, leaving right. the reporters at the uh, Detroit Grand Jury in 1975, a few months after Hoffa disappeared, he took the fifth. Right. He and his brother Gabe uh, were uh, Genevieve's uh, crime family associates, so said. Right. Right. And then... Uh, Sally Bugs was shot to death on Mulberry Street in Manhattan three right. years later. Right. Your theory is that right. his boss, Tony Provenzano, Tony Pro, he and Hoffa had a fist fight in, in prison. The fist fight and the beef was, and the meeting was not about regaining the Teamsters presidency, no. but the fact that Hoffa wouldn't right. loan money yeah. to fund the uh, Provenzano of the way, yes. casino? Yeah, because the Provenzano was going all, all around New York trying to find, you know, he, he went to the, the, the local the 282 pension fund in, out in Long Island. And they gave him fifty million dollars, thirty-eight percent of the of, of 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 the workers' pension, and the federal government stopped in and blocked that. So they were getting blocked e almost everywhere for the things. At that point in New Jersey too, there were so many corrupt banks um, that uh, I mean, the first money to buy the 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 the, 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 the lot in Vegas the, the, came in a, in a shoebox from Juliana to the to the Bank of Chatham, which was taken which was basically a mob hostage bank mm -hmm. and then and then laundered and, and used to for the down payment for that land. All right. And again, partnership, Bergoglio is, is partners with the guy that's buying the strip property. So then they, well, by the way, Bank yeah. of Chatham, I don't even know if the Bank of Chatham still exists. They're not here. No, it to, right. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. So there's, there's that. Right. So they have this meeting in that house, supposedly in Detroit. Right. And the meeting was to settle the money over this casino right. that uh, yeah. Provenzano wanted to build and that Hoffa refused to fund. Hoffa basically doing the right thing. It was a reconciliation meeting between Hoffa and Provenzano. And they, they walk into that house and there it is, totally empty. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Jimmy Hoffa realizes no one is there. So when he turns around, leaves, uh, Sharon says he shot him in the back of the head. Right, right. Well, yeah, Hoffa knew when he looked up and saw Bergoglio there instead of Provenzano, knew he was dead. What should happen in this case? Finally, how do we finally get? Well, again, for historical reasons, just let us, you know, let let's let's figure out who did what. I mean, I don't like the uh, the doctor. Um, after this story, he was indicted, um, pled guilty, and he was a doctor who was the front man. Yes, yeah, yeah he was the front man, and uh, you know, came back out and 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 and, and you know, and went on to become chief of surgery at a, a Valley uh, what, Valley Hospital. What would you, What would you say to the Hoffa family now, since you've invest you've investigated this for more than forty years, basically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of those old albatrosses you get. It's every every reporter has one of those stories they carry and, with them. And what type of closure or sense of comfort can you give to James P. Hoffa, the president of the Teamsters, and uh, and his sister Barbara Crancer, former judge? I, I don't look. Is there going to be? Will they find a body? No. What I've been told is that, like Dan Molina said, it was put in a 50-gallon drum, right? And it was brought to New Jersey. It was actually bought further south to New Jersey to a chicken farm that w w was run by Bergoglio. And uh, it was, the, the, the body was shredded, and both the remains of the body and the shredding machine were taken out and, and dumped into the ocean. So you, we're never going to find it. So there's no, there's no, there's, there's going to be no funeral. Um, but um, the most logical answer you can have is, 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 is just a solid sense of what happened that day. We're putting it together, and more gets added every year, you know? So uh, at least just knowing what happened, who the problem was, who the enemy was, um, and what the fundamental motive was, because 
you know, I mean, again, Hoffa coming back and, and, and mm -hmm. challenging, it would have taken years. And, and you know, politically, he, he, he might not have gotten yeah, very far, yeah. you know. Well, Ed, you've done amazing work all these years. It's been a joy uh, <laughs> uh, to be partnered with you uh, yeah. on our investigation. And we are, you've done it for 40 years, longer than I have. Yeah, 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 but yeah. we're going to continue. Well, that's because you're so young. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we're going to continue here on the Fox News Channel uh, through the next of the year. Again, Ed, thank you, as always. Our special program is on Fox Nation, our new streaming service. It is called Riddle, the search for James R. Hoffa. We also have podcasts on there. Go on Fox Nation to take a look. Ed, thank you. Arthel. Eric, I don't know which is more impressive, the story or the fact that you have that vintage newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, great job. Millions of people right now under a blanket of messy, wet weather this weekend. How long will it last? And is it too soon to predict who might see a white Christmas? We'll go live to the Fox Weather Center.